Hello everyone. In this video lecture, we would like to find out the nature of space distribution of MMF for a single full pitch coil. So, what we want to actually find is that uh, given a single coil, that single coil which we are considering here, that single coil is assumed to be a full pitch coil. So, full pitch coil is a coil uh, whose coil span is 180 degree electrical and uh, we are interested in knowing the variation of magnetomotive force in the air gap periphery with uh, the distance as we are moving along the air gap periphery how the magnitude of MMF changes for this single coil AA dash which is uh, shown here this is coil side A this is coil side A dash so this is my single coil A dash so for this single coil A dash we want to find out the nature of uh, space distribution of MMF by space distribution we mean that we will find the magnitude uh, of MMF along this air gap periphery that means we start from this point along this point along this point we will try to find out what is the magnitude of MMF along this air gap periphery so this is what we mean by the word space distribution of MMF now to begin with let me first uh, uh, explain what has been drawn here this is a cross sectional view this is the cross sectional view of a stator core and uh, rotor core this outer circle shown by red this outer circle shown by red is the stator core and the inner circle shown by this black is the rotor core so this being the cross sectional view you are uh, looking this stator core and rotor core as circle but actually these are cylinders so you can uh, easily figure out that if you cut a cylinder let's say if this is uh, if if this is the cylinder so if i am cutting this cylinder by a plane the plane being normal or perpendicular to the axis of the cylinder then you see a circle from the front so that's why you are seeing this circle so this circle shown by black line is actually the rotor core which is a cylinder but since we are taking the cross sectional view so it is uh, appearing a circle here in the diagram the outer ring which is shown by this red color the outer ring which is shown by the red color is also a cylindrical structure but since we are cutting this cylindrical structure by a plane which is uh, normal to the axis of the cylinder we have seeing this ring like structure so this red color ring like structure is nothing but the stator core and the inner uh, circle shown by this black line is your uh, rotor core now i have indicated only two slots one slot is shown over here and another slot is shown over here so these two slots you can find that they are uh, diametrically opposite that means these two slots which are placed on the stator core they are shown diametrically opposite so meaning what that if they are shown diametrically opposite that means we have drawn these magnetic lines of flux for a two pole configuration so why we are so confident in saying why we are so much confident in saying that it is a two pole configuration uh, you can uh, recall recall the relation between theta electrical and theta mechanical theta electrical is given by what p by 2 theta mechanical so if number of poles is 2 in that case theta electrical and mechanical are same so you can write this relation let's say theta electrical is nothing but p by 2 theta mechanical so under what circumstances we can say that electrical degree and mechanical degree are equal electrical degree and mechanical degree will be equal only if number of poles p is 2 so here you see we are uh, as i have said in the beginning that we will be deriving the uh, space distribution of mmf for a single coil but that single coil happens to be a full pitch coil so by definition of this full pitch coil we mean that the coil span should be 180 degree electrical so you see the two sides of the coil this is my coil 
so this is coil side a and this is coil side a dash so the two so the two coil sides a and a dash are placed diametrically opposite so mechanically they are 180 degree apart so if theta mechanical is 180 degree and here the number of poles is actually 2 so uh, 2 2 gets cancelled so you get theta electrical to be 180 degree also so you see it is actually a full pitch coil now although it is a single coil although it is a single coil but this coil has got n number of turns where n is an integer where n is a positive integer so n number of turns i have tried to represent here a coil which is having two turns or you can say it is a double turn coil see this is you you, you start from here so starting from here you are coming up to this point so this is one turn again you start from here you move along like this you move along like this this is your second turn so it is a double turn coil or you can say it is a two turn coil so in general if it is a n turn coil in general if this coil is n turn coil in that case there will be n number of turns so that means what number of coils is only one but this one single coil has got n number of turns so we call it is a multi turn coil so we are interested in finding the nature of space variation of magnetomotive force for a single full pitch coil and that single full pitch coil happens to be a multi turn coil let's say it is a n turn coil now if this single coil a dash which is a full pitch coil but it is having n number of turns is being placed diametrically opposite meaning what that it is a full pitch coil since we have taken the number of poles to be 2 now let me uh, just add a little thing if this would have been a 4 pole machine in that case if this would have been a 4 pole machine in that case the slots a and a dash would not be placed diametrically opposite rather they would be placed at a mechanical degree of 90 degrees away that means what you see you can do the calculation from here according to definition full pitch coil is a coil whose coil whose coil span is 180 degree electrical so for coil span i should write how much 180 degree electrical because we are considering full pitch coil but if the number of poles is 4 so for instead of p we should write 4 because number of poles is 4 now by solving this equation you can readily find that theta mechanical is coming as nothing but 90 degree so what you can make out that if this stator and rotor core are having four number of poles four number of poles in that case the two slots which are housing the two sides of a full pitch coil would be at a angular distance of 90 degree from each other as per this equation isn't it but here we are considering number of poles to be 2 so if the number of poles is 2 what advantage we get if the number of poles is 2 then we don't have to worry or think over about electrical and mechanical degrees separately because when you have taken the number of poles to be 2 in that case electrical and mechanical degree are same so we don't uh, have to worry about this uh, electrical and mechanical degrees separately each and every time we simply can make the analysis since for number of poles when it is 2 electrical and mechanical degrees are equal now let's come over here if see let's say if this coil is carrying current i so this current i will be carried by this coil side this i will be carried by this coil side like this so if you if you try to find out what do you find that this coil side is having how many conductors this coil side is having two conductors why two conductors because it's a double turn coil if this coil would have three number of turns in that case there would be three conductors on this side as well as three conductors on this side in case if this coil would have three turns so in general if this coil is having n number of turns in that case there will be n number of conductors on this coil side also there will be n number of conductors on this side of the coil side that means what depending upon the number of turns if the number of turns of the coil is n in that case there will be n conductors on this coil side 
also n conductors will be there on this coil size, isn't it? So going by this logic, this coil A dash is assumed to be a multi-turn coil having n number of turns. So there will be n conductors in this slot and also there will be n number of conductors in this slot. Further, if it is carrying current I, then current enclosed in this slot will be n into I. Because of the simple fact that this being a n turn coil, the number of conductors on this coil side will be n as well as number of conductors on this coil side will be also n because it is a n turn coil. Now if it is carrying current I, then this slot is having n number of conductors which is carrying current I. So the total current in this slot becomes number of conductors n multiplied by current carried by each conductor that is I, that is ni. Likewise here also the number of conductors in the slot is n and it is carrying current I. So each of the n conductors, each of the n conductors are carrying current I. That means the total current carried by this slot is ni as well as this slot also is carrying total current ni. Okay. Now what is our basic approach in order to find out the space variation of MMF? or rather you can say space distribution of MMF for single for this single full pitch coil having n number of turns. We have to basically take the develop view. So what is the meaning of develop view? Develop view simply you are making the stator core and rotor stator core and rotor core laid flat. That means laid flat means what? You imagine that the stator core and rotor core are being cut at a point. Let's say here it is being cut the stator core and rotor core are being cut here. So from here what you do? You stretch it and lay it flat like this. So it is simply laid out flat. Which things are laid out flat? Stator core and rotor core are laid out flat. So this is the developed view of this thing. Now before we start we need to think over. What we need to think over? We need to think over that in what manner we can uh, pinpoint or accurately determine a particular point along the air gap periphery. So for that purpose what is done? We are defining an axis which will be called as our reference axis. That means with respect to that reference axis we will try to measure the location of a point along the air gap periphery. As you are aware that between the stator core and rotor core there will be a small air gap between the stator core and rotor core there will be a small air gap. So this small air gap is given so that the rotor is able to rotate. Otherwise if you do not provide any air gap between stator and rotor then rotor will get foul or rotor will get entangled with the stator core it will not be able to move. So usually a small air gap is provided between stator core and rotor core. So that small air gap is this one. However you might be knowing that this air gap between stator core and rotor core is skipped as small as mechanical it is possible. This is to make sure that reluctance which is offered to the magnetic lines of flux is very minimum or very less because if you if you make the air gap between the stator core and, it, and rotor core if you make the uh, air gap between stator core and rotor core very large or big in that case what will happen the magnetic lines of flux which are crossing the stator core and entering the rotor core, they will face a larger air gap length and larger air gap length means larger reluctance. Larger reluctance means larger drop in MMF. Larger drop in MMF means that we need more number of turns or more current in order to set up the same flux. So what is the actual strategy adopted? Whenever, a, whenever an electrical machine is designed, I mean to say whenever a rotating electrical machine is designed, we always try to do our best so as to keep the air gap between the stator core and rotor core as small as mechanically it is possible. So that reluctance offered to the magnetic lines of flux is a minimum and also we require very less amount of MMF in order to set up the magnetic flux. So that's why it is less. Now what I was talking that how we can locate or pinpoint or you can say how we can identify a particular point along the air gap periphery. So for doing that we have defined a reference axis. So this line which is passing through slot A, please look here, 
this line which is passing through slot A is defined as our reference axis. That means what? We will say that this axis is our reference axis and a point on this axis will be like, like this one, this one. If a, a point on this axis will be defined by alpha equal to 0. That means we will define this point which is in front of slot A or coil side A. We will define this point in the air gap. We will define this point on the air gap which is in front of coil side A by angle alpha equal to 0. So this line passing through slot A is our reference axis. This is our alpha equal to 0. So going by this logic, if you take a point in front of the coil side A dash, that means here, please look here. So this point which is in the air gap, but it is in front of coil side A dash. So this point which is in the air gap, but in front of the coil side A dash, this point will be identified by alpha equal to 180 degree. Likewise, this point will be identified by alpha equal to 90 degree, isn't it? This point will be identified by alpha equal to 270 degree. So in this way, what can be done? Any point along the air gap periphery can be identified by a single variable that is alpha. And we call this alpha as your space angle. Space angle means with the help of this angle alpha, which is defined as space angle, we are able to locate or we are able to identify any point in the air gap in a unique way. You are, you are able to identify any point in the air gap by a unique way. By defining the value of alpha, if you define alpha to be 90 degree, then that point is this. If you define alpha to be 180 degree, then that point is this. If you define alpha to be 0 degree, then that point is this. So, with the help of this, we are able to identify a point along the air gap periphery in a unique way. So that is why we are defining this angle alpha which is termed as space angle. And for defining the space angle alpha, we have to choose a reference axis and that reference axis is passing through uh, coil side A which is, in, uh, which is placed in this slot. Now, after that uh, you have to just uh, look over regarding the direction of the magnetic lines of flux which is being plotted here. So you see this coil side A dash is assumed to carry dot current. Dot current means what? Dot means current is leaving the board and it is coming towards the observer. So you imagine that there is a conductor. Let us say this is my conductor. So this conductor is representing the conductor due to coil side A dash. And dot means what? Current is leaving the board. So my thumb should be out of the board because thumb should be in the direction of current. Now what I am doing, I am holding the conductor which is placed in uh, coil side A dash. So I am holding the conductor which is placed in this slot and this conductor is carrying dot current. So current is leaving the board. So my thumb is also out of the board. That means thumb is in the direction of current. Now by grabbing this conductor in this way, I have to just rotate this four fingers. So you see in which direction the four fingers are rotating. Now these four fingers of this my right hand will rotate in the direction of the lines of flux. So you see, these are the lines of flux. The same way we can be done for this one. For this coil side A, it is shown that the conductors for coil side A is carrying cross current. Cross means what current is entering into the board. So my thumb should be directed towards the board. And I am grabbing this conductor with my right hand. And thumb is in the direction of the current. Now I will allow my four fingers to curl. So in whichever direction these four fingers of the right hand is, is getting curled, that will be the direction of the magnetic lines of flux for this one. So according to that rule, we have already plotted this magnetic lines of flux over here. Now by the plot of the magnetic lines of flux, we see that magnetic lines of flux are directed along this axis. So this axis is known as magnetic axis of this full pitch coil A A dash having n turns. So this is the magnetic axis. Simply you can also use this right hand rule. What you can do is that, let me tell you that you, you assume that, let us assume that this is a coil. So let's say this is coil side A and this is coil side A dash. So what you have to do? You have to make sure that the right hand four fingers should always be directed along the direction of current. 
how we will ensure that the nails of the four finger should be in the direction of current so coil side a is carrying cross current so it is entering into the board so my nails are also entering into the board and then from behind of the board it is coming out because this coil side a dash coil side a dash is having what current coil side a dash is having dot current so it will the current will be directed in this direction so you move this right hand in this way where is the thumb pointing when i am moving this right hand four fingers making sure that the nails of the four fingers are in the direction of current the coil side a is having cross current that means it is entering into the board you see the thumb is pointing in this direction so this is the magnetic axis of the coil a a dash so by this rule also you can find that the magnetic axis of the coil a a dash will be directed along this direction okay like this one now after saying this let me tell you that we have taken the developed view of the stator core and rotor core that means we are assuming that stator core is being cut let's say it is being cut at this point it is being cut at this point here it is being this thing is being cut so you are cutting it you are cutting the stator core and rotor core at this point okay you are cutting the stator core and rotor core at this point and then you are laying it flat that means this portion is held by my left hand and this is by this portion by my right hand i am stretching it and laying it flat so it will be like this now this lines of flux due to current carried by coil side a dash and a is also plotted here also okay now what has to be done we have to make certain assumption so as to uh, so as to arrive at a reasonable conclusion what is the assumption which are going to make the first assumption is that the reluctance which is offered by the stator core and rotor core is almost zero that means we are assuming that the permeability the permeability of the stator core iron and the permeability of the rotor core iron is tending towards infinity so that reluctance offered by the stator core iron and rotor core iron tends to zero so if the iron portion of the stator core and rotor core are, are assumed to have infinite permeability then they are offering no reluctance to the magnetic lines of flux only reluctance is offered by the air gap let's say air gap length is small g so what is small g i am written have i written g as somewhere a b c d you know so oh, i have written g so let us write something else let's write uh, l l l is not used in the symbol so we can write l let's write l so what is l l is nothing but the length of the air gap l is nothing but the length of the air gap so this is l l is what l is the length of the air gap between the stator core and rotor core now so this is our first assumption that the permeability of the stator core and rotor core are infinite so that the reluctance of it is almost zero what is our second assumption our second assumption is that the air gap length between the stator core and rotor core is very small is very small compared to the compared to the pole pitch length so what is the pole pitch length if you measure the distance if you measure the peripheral distance if you measure the peripheral distance between coil side a and a dash so this distance from coil side a to coil side a dash this peripheral distance this peripheral distance will be termed as a pole pitch so we are assuming that air gap length is much smaller compared to the pole pitch of the coil so what this assumption will allow us this assumption that air gap length is very small compared to the pole pitch of the coil a a dash will allow us to say that the air gap is being crossed by the magnetic lines of flux in a radial manner that means whatever magnetic lines of flux is leaving the stator core and entering the rotor core this will cross the air gap in a radial manner in a radial direction that means as if the lines of flux will enter the rotor core radially along the radius of the board okay so we are making this second assumption what is our second assumption that air gap length between the stator core and rotor core is very small compared to the pole pitch of the coil a a dash what is the pole pitch of the coil a a dash the peripheral distance between coil side a and a dash so this will allow us to assume that magnetic lines of flux is crossing the air gap length radially 
or in radial direction. Now, let us make another assumption, or rather, it's not assumption. I would say it is not assumption. Rather, it's a uh, convention. What kind of convention? We will define that if the lines of flux is leaving the stator core and entering the rotor core, it will be taken as positive. So, how we are defining positive flux? Positive magnetic lines of flux are defined those lines of flux which will be leaving the stator core and entering the rotor core. So, obviously, the lines of flux which are leaving the rotor core and entering the stator core will be termed as negative. So, accordingly, this portion of the lines of flux you can notice here for this portion of the lines of flux what do you see lines of flux is leaving the stator core and they are entering the rotor core so they are termed as positive in this portion what happens lines of flux is leaving the rotor core and they are entering the stator core so this portion is negative okay now what remains to be done is that we will reiterate a law which is known as ampere circuital law Ampere circuital law states that MMF acting along a closed path, MMF acting along a closed path equals to equals to the net current which is being enclosed by that path. So, what what does it say that if you choose a closed path in a magnetic circuit, if you choose a closed path in a magnetic circuit, so in that magnetic circuit, the MMF acting along that closed path will be equal to the current which is being enclosed by that closed path. So, for example, let us say this path, let us name, uh, I have already named, what is the name of the path? U, B, C, V, W, D, E, X. So, in this closed path, the MMF acting along this closed path will be equal to the current which is being enclosed by the closed path. Now, let me uh, just uh, recap so that there is no confusion. This point U, this point U is on the, please zoom it here. This point, uh, this point U is on the stator core. Point X is on the rotor core. Likewise, point V is on the stator core. Point W is on the rotor core. So, let me tell me once more. Point U is on the stator core. Point V is also on the stator core. Point X is on the rotor core. Point W is on the rotor core. Okay? And obviously B, C is in the stator core. Point E, D are in the rotor core. Okay? Now what we see that this slot A is having how many number of conductors? N number of conductors because it is a N turned coil and it is carrying current I. So here you have N number of conductors and each conductor is carrying current I. So, what is the net current enclosed in this path? Path named as U, B, C, V, W, D, E, X. The net current enclosed is Ni. So, the MMF acting along this closed path named as U, B, C, V, W, D, E, X. In this closed path, the MMF acting is Ni. Because of the simple reason that Ampere circuital law states that MMF acting along a closed path equals to the current which is being enclosed by the closed path. So, in this uh, closed path named as U, B, C, V, W, D, E, X, the current enclosed is the current carried by the conductors in slot A. But what is the number of conductors in slot A? N because coil A dash is a N turn coil and each conductor is carrying current I. So, the net current enclosed is Ni. Now, you will find that this MMF acting along this closed path will appear as a drop. What kind of drop? MMF drop. MMF drop is defined as nothing but MMF drop is defined as um, the product of reluctance and flux. So, you multiply reluctance by flux. You multiply reluctance, magnetic reluctance by flux phi. So, magnetic reluctance multiplied by phi is the MMF drop. So, what is the net MMF acting along this closed path? Net MMF acting along this closed path is Ni. Now, what is RL? RL is nothing but the reluctance offered by the iron portion. RL is nothing but the reluctance of portion, reluctance of iron core. 
so reluctance of iron core on the stator core and rotor core is which path you just uh, zoom it here you see you will see that path uh, which is defined by these points u b c v let me tell me once more u b c v this path is on the stator core iron likewise path defined by w d e x path defined by w d e x is on the rotor core so this length of the path u b c v u b c v and w d e x this path are on the stator core and rotor core but we have assumed earlier itself that the reluctance offered by the iron portion of the stator core and rotor core is zero so no reluctance is offered to the magnetic lines of flux so basically here rl is actually zero because of the assumption that the stator core and uh, and the rotor core the stator core and rotor core are having infinite permeability so reluctance offered by the stator core and rotor core is zero so rl which was denoting the reluctance of iron core on stator and rotor that will be also zero so only what is remaining rg what is rg rg is nothing but it is the reluctance of air gap it is the reluctance of air gap so it is the reluctance of air gap now please uh, observe carefully it's uh, very easy to find that when you are moving along the closed path uh, when you are moving along the closed path named as u b c v w d e x you are crossing the air gap how many times twice isn't it when you are moving along the path u b c v w d e x u if you are moving along this closed path you are crossing the air gap how many times twice you are crossing the air gap here once and again you are crossing the air gap here once so in this closed path denoted as u b c v w d e x u you are crossing the air gap twice so if you are crossing the air gap twice that means what reluctance offered to the magnetic lines of flux by this air gap will be twice the air gap length twice the air gap length so here you see the total mmf acting along this closed path is ni and that ni is is appearing as a mmf drop across rg but rg is actually what reluctance of the air gap so it is reluctance of air gap but it is reluctance of air gap but what do you see that this is the reluctance of air gap twice it is actually twice because if i if i consider this closed path i am crossing the air gap twice na so rg is nothing but it is the reluctance of air gap twice so now if somebody asks you that what is the drop in mmf across the air gap what will what should be the answer it should be ni by 2 why ni by 2 because you see for yourself that this magnetic equivalent magnetic circuit magnetic circuit for this path this is nothing but a magnetic circuit we are re replacing the emf by mmf and we are replacing the resistance by reluctance and we are replacing the current by flux so you see in this closed path you are crossing the air gap twice na so rg is nothing but reluctance of air gap but this air gap is being crossed twice so that's what is the reluctance of air gap twice so what is the drop in mmf in rg ni but rg is what reluctance of air gap twice so if somebody ask you what is the drop in mmf across the air gap it will be obviously ni by 2 because it will be half of rg because rg is the twice air gap length so half is the drop in mmf so it will be ni by 2 so that's why it is shown ni by 2 across here however one point should be coming in mind what is that why mmf variation is almost a straight line or it's flat you see between coil side a and a dash between coil side a and a dash the variation of mmf is almost flat it's not either increasing or decreasing it is it is your uh, parallel it is parallel to the space angle alpha space angle alpha means the distance along the air gap periphery space angle alpha means nothing but it is the distance along the air gap periphery because as you 
change the value of alpha you are moving along the air gap periphery when alpha is 0 you are here when alpha is 90 degree you are here when alpha is 180 degree you are here so as you are changing the value of the space angle alpha actually you are moving along the air gap periphery so this axis is the axis along which you plot the value of space angle alpha or you may call or you may also call this axis to be the distance moved along air gap periphery now why this line is flat you can figure out here what you can figure out initially you see initially which uh, which path i have taken i have taken up this inner path now even if you take this outer path what you will find in the outer path that the portion of the path which is lying in the stator core iron and portion of the path which is lying in the rotor core iron they will have negligible reluctance so again this outer path is also crossing the air gap twice so here also the drop in mmf should be how much ni by 2 actually in this closed path the current enclosed is ni but you are crossing the air gap twice that's why you say that drop in mmf across the air gap is ni by 2 now what about the length in the iron core you see uh, if you allow me to name it so that it's easy let me allow i should not use the symbol l because it is given here already so let me uh, write something else let's say this point is m m i have not used this point is uh, small n this point is say q this point is say p p this point is say r this is your s this point is t now focus on this one what is this uh, what is the point m point m is on the stator core okay this is point m it is on the stator core what is point p point p is also on the stator core what about point r point r is on the rotor core what about point uh, let's say it is your z what about point z z is on the rotor core so now you consider the path m n you consider the path m n q p r s t z so which path i am asking to consider m n q p r s r s t z isn't it so this is these are the points now what do you see if you compare this path with earlier path, what was the earlier path? Let me name it U B U B C V U B C V W D W D E X E X. Isn't it? So let us name. Huh? Let us say this is our path number one and this is our path number two. So I have named these two paths. So this is your path number one. And this is your path number two. So in path number one, which is the thing? Path number one, UBC, UBC, VWEX, UBC, VWDEX, DEX. And in path number two, what is the path portion? MNQPR, MNQPR, STZ, STZ. Now, if you compare these two paths, if you compare path number 1 and path number 2 what is the immediate conclusion we should draw if we compare these two paths as named here path number 1 and path number 2 this is this is your path number 1 and this outer part is the path number 2 so by comparing these two paths path number 1 and 2 one can one can easily figure out that which is longer path which is longer in length path number 2 is longer in length whereas path number one is shorter in length so you may think that if the path number two is chosen so since the path number two is longer in length so mmf drop should be more here and path number one is shorter in length then mmf drop should be less here so as per this logic this variation of mmf should not be parallel to the space angle alpha axis but think again think again 
think in a clear way what i want to say is that the portion of the magnetic path which are falling in the stator core and rotor core they do not count at all this point has to be kept in mind very clearly what i am saying let me repeat once more the portion of the magnetic path which is lying on the stator core and the portion of the magnetic path which is lying on the rotor core they do not count why they do not count they do not count because of the simple fact that we have assumed in the beginning that the iron portion that the iron portion of the stator and rotor core will have infinite permeability that means reluctance offered by the stator core iron and rotor core iron will be zero so it is immaterial whether the portion of the magnetic path falling in the stator core portion and rotor core portion is shorter or longer if you consider path number 2 then you will find that in path number 2 the portion of the magnetic path in the iron core of the stator and rotor is longer in length whereas for path number 1 the portion of the magnetic path in the stator core and rotor core is shorter in length okay but the fact is that the reluctance of the stator core and rotor core they do not count why they do not count because we have assumed they are offering zero reluctance so that means the things boils down that what is the length of the magnetic path in the air gap so you see here for path number 1 what is the length of the magnetic path in the air gap vw and here xu so they are equal and same again come to path number 2 for path number 2 what is the length of the air gap in the magnetic circuit in the in the magnetic circuit what is the length of the air gap for path number 2 which we have chosen here for path number 2 the air gap length in the magnetic circuit is pr and zn now pr and zn is equal to vw nxu that means what if you think clearly what you will find that reluctance offered by path number 1 and reluctance offered by path number 2 are equal why they are equal because the length of the air gap because the length of the air gap in path number 1 and 2 are equal however the length of the magnetic length in the magnetic circuit in the stator core iron and rotor core iron they are not equal for path number 1 and 2 but again i am saying the reluctance of the stator core and rotor core do not count because we have assumed they are having infinite permeability so reluctance offered is zero so it is immaterial whether the length of the magnetic path in the iron core of the stator and rotor are longer or shorter because they do not count only thing counts is the length of the air gap now you choose any path you choose any path the length of the air gap is always going to be same so the drop of mmf so the drop in mmf in the air gap will be same so according to this logic the drop in mmf between this point a and a dash will be always ni by 2 now why it is becoming ni by 2 i have told earlier again i am saying once more that when you are crossing the air gap length along a closed path you are crossing it twice say for this path number 1 you are crossing the air gap here once and again you are crossing the air gap here once so you are crossing it twice so that's why the mmf drop in the air gap is appearing twice but what is the current enclosed what is the current enclosed in this closed path ni so ni is getting as mmf drop across the reluctance rg but what is rg reluctance of the air gap twice why twice because we are crossing the air gap twice now this flat portion is being as uh, now explained because the air gap length is always uniform so the drop in mmf is also uniform as far as the iron portion is concerned reluctance of the iron portion is not coming into counting because they are having infinite permeability so zero reluctance now why here it is coming negative this is according to our convention which we have assumed in the beginning what we have assumed in the beginning that if flux is leaving the stator core and entering the rotor core it will be taken as positive so if the flux is leaving the rotor core and entering the stator core it will be taken as negative so that's why this negative sign is there so this is the variation of mmf rather i should uh, use the word space variation so this is the space variation of magnetomotive force or space variation of mmf for a single full pitch coil having n number of turns so this is the variation now these lines of flux which is being plotted here you can easily uh, 
figure out i have not said you apply that right hand grip rule here conductor is carrying cross current that means current is entering into the board so i will assume there is a conductor and the conductor is carrying current such that it is cross cross means it uh, cross means it is entering the board so my thumb should be towards the board and i am gripping i am gripping the conductor with my right hand such that the thumb is in the direction of current now i am curling these four fingers so this is in the direction of the magnetic lines of flux like this the same thing here dot means what it is leaving the board so i am grabbing the conductor with my right hand dot means current is leaving the board so thumb is out of the board and i am i am curling the four fingers so you can plot the magnetic lines of flux in this way okay now what was said as pole pitch pole pitch was the peripheral distance peripheral distance between the two coil sides that is a and a dash a and a dash now this being a full pitch coil this being a full pitch coil the peripheral distance has to be half of the semicircle that is 180 degree mechanical okay now after saying this what i can say is that while discussing this mmr variation due to the current carried by this single coil which is a full pitch coil but it is but it is having n number of turns what we have assumed that the value of the current i is constant what we have assumed that the full pitch coil having n number of turns which is denoted by coil a a dash is carrying current i where current i is not changing with time current i is constant what will happen to this mmf variation space variation of mmf if the coil i carries sinusoidal current what will happen let's say if this coil i is not a constant current rather it's a sinusoidal current given by i am sin omega t where i am is the maximum value and it is a sinusoidal current in that case what is going to happen it's a simple you can think out that this height it is going to increase and decrease and again it will reverse on this side simultaneously this height is going to increase and decrease why you see number of turns of the coil is fixed it is not going to change number of turns of the coil n is fixed it is not going to change but current i is going to increase and decrease because if the coil is carrying current i which is sinusoidal then at omega t equal to 0 sin 0 is 0 if you put omega t as 0 then sin 0 is 0 so i will be 0 so it will be a flat line like this at omega t equal to at omega t equal to 30 degree what will happen at omega t equal to 30 degree this will be sin 30 so sin 30 is what half so this will be im by 2 so it will have a height which is given by n into im by 2 at omega t equal to 60 degree it will be sin 60 that means root 3 by 2 so it will be a into im into root 3 by 2 so height will increase further likewise at omega t equal to 90 degree it will be maximum that is sin 90 is 1 so it will be n im by 2 but after 90 at 120 again it will come down at 1 it will become zero after 1 it will become negative and simultaneously this side will become positive so in this way it will increase and decrease this thing will start from zero reach a peak point again come to zero and again it will increase and increase in the negative direction and this thing will start from zero increase in the negative direction then come to zero again it will increase in the positive direction so in this way it will change so in case the coil i is uh, carrying in case the coil a dash in case the coil a dash is carrying current i in that case the mmf in the air gap will be function of both space and time it will be function of both space and time however if the coil a a dash is carrying current i which is constant which is not changing in that case the mmf in the air gap will be a function of space only it will be not a function of time it will be a function of space only provided current i is constant which is carried by the coil a a dash but if coil a dash is carrying a current which is itself changing with time in that case the mmf variation along the air gap will be both function of the space or the position 
and also equal to function of time. Okay. Now uh, you can uh, simply figure out that by this developed view along which portion north pole is formed. You see, for north pole, what should happen? Lines of flux will leave the stator core. So this portion is your north pole. Okay. And for south pole, lines of flux will enter the stator core. So this portion is a south pole. Okay. This portion is a south pole. So here also you can see lines of flux is leaving here. So this is my north pole. And here lines of flux are entering. So this is my south pole. Okay. Now you can find it here that where is the peak occurring? Peak of this thing is occurring between coil side A and A dash. And also there is a negative peak between coil side A dash and A. That is here. So here also the same thing is happening. According to our convention, if lines of flux is leaving the stator core and entering the rotor core, it will be positive. So here what is happening? Positive peak. And here what is happening? Negative peak. So this point is, is uh, this point is corresponding to this point. And this point is corresponding to this point. So this is alpha equal to how much? 90 degree. And this is alpha equals to how much? 270. You can you can just simplify. This was our alpha equal to 0. So this is alpha equal to 90. This is alpha equal to 180. This is alpha equal to this point is alpha equal to 180. Na? This is alpha equal to 180 and this is alpha equal to 270. This is 270 degrees. Okay. So you can simply correlate that this point in the air gap corresponds to this one and this point in the air gap corresponds to this one. Okay. Now you have studied Fourier series. So Fourier series is a technique of representing a periodic quantity which is non-sinusoidal as a summation of large number of sinusoidal quantities. So here you see although this space distribution of MMF is a periodic quantity and this periodic quantity is having finite number of discontinuity. It is having discontinuity at this point. It is having discontinuity at this point. So it is satisfying Dirichlet's condition. Dirichlet's condition needs to be satisfied for applying Fourier series to a waveform. It says that the periodic waveform, which is of course not sinusoidal, the periodic waveform should have finite number of maximum and minima it should have finite number of discontinuity. So it is satisfying your Dirichlet's condition. So you can apply Fourier series. So if you apply Fourier series, this rectangular MMF distribution, this kind of, uh, this kind of waveform is known by the name of rectangular MMF distribution can be represented as a summation of large number of sine wave. Out of this large number of sine wave, that sine wave which has got the same time period as that of this rectangular MMF wave will be termed as fundamental component. So fundamental component of sine wave can be uh, shown to be like this. So this is the fundamental component of sine wave. Okay, this is the fundamental component of sine wave. So this thing can be found out by applying Fourier series. So we, uh, we actually define a term space harmonics. What is the meaning of space harmonics? You see, this MMM variation is actually rectangular in nature, but you are applying Fourier series in order to express this rectangular MMF as a summation of large number of sinusoidal waves. Out of this large number of sinusoidal waves, the sinusoidal wave which is having the same time period as that of the original non-sinusoidal wave, that means this rectangular wave, that sinusoidal wave which is having the same time period as that of the rectangular MMF wave will be termed as the fundamental component. So this thing is nothing but it is the fundamental component. This is the fundamental component of MMF and of course there will be harmonic terms also there. There will be harmonic terms also which is not indicating. So these sinusoidal quantities will be termed as space harmonics because they are this uh, non sinusoidal uh, this sinusoidal wave of having multiple uh, of having multiple time period 
compared to the fundamental wave will be termed as harmonics but these harmonics are coming into picture due to the non sinusoidal mmf distribution in space so that's why these are known as space harmonics these are known as space harmonics because they are coming into picture due to the non sinusoidal mmf distribution in space okay so let it be up to here okay thank you